Hi everyone, welcome back to our channel. Bex here today to talk about my booktube prize group for the semifinals. I read once again for nonfiction and I had the A group. And as sort of a wrap up of everything that I read, I'm once again going to share my ranking with all of you from worst to best, though I'll probably call this video something else just to make it a little more exciting. We'll start at number six, which is the worst one, and work our way up to number one. And if you read for this group or read for really any group in the booktube prize, let me know how your section went for you. For me overall, this time not too bad. I actually think it was a little bit worse than the octafinals just because the book that I ranked number six in this group I really didn't care for, whereas my number six in the octafinals wasn't this bad. Uh, the, the one that I did rank number six was A Swim in a Pond in the Rain, in which four Russians give a master class on writing, reading, and life. This is by George Saunders, who is well known for other books like Lincoln and the Bardo, which has won an award, I believe. So like, I was aware of his name, but I just didn't think the sound of this book was that interesting to me. But I, you know, of course, I have to give it a shot. I have to give all of these a shot. So this is basically an MFA class that George Saunders teaches at Syracuse University, and he teaches a Russian short story class. So this book is almost like if you took his class, you read a bunch of short stories and then he spends another chapter sort of analyzing it. At first I was getting along okay with it but then as things went on it just reminded me why I didn't go into like English literature for university. It was just too much analysis at some point. It was just too much at once. I enjoy a bit of analysis in books. I like kind of understanding the background story often of where the author's from, like where a book is set, and sort of understanding how that influences the story, right? And this got into that, but it also just got into so much more in terms of like the nitty gritty actual writing and giving tips for short stories, giving prompts and ideas for how you can make your short stories better. And as somebody that has no desire to write anything anymore, I really didn't want to read that part of it and so it just grated on me eventually and if I had not been forced to read this book for the book two prize, I won, never would have picked it up because I just knew it wasn't something I was going to be interested in. And if I, for some weird reason I had picked it up and I wasn't being told that I needed to finish it in order to accurately rank it, I would have DNF'd it. I really had to push through this book. I basically told myself, okay, you need to read 50 pages a day so you can finish this book as soon as possible because I had one more book to read. So that's really how I felt about this one. If you are into Russian short stories, if you like kind of literary, not quite literary criticism, but like talking about writing and literature in a very in-depth way, this book could be for you. I'm a little surprised that it made it into the semifinals, but oh well. I made it through. Wouldn't really recommend unless you have very specific interests. Number five is The Groundbreaking, An American City and Its Search for Justice by Scott Ellsworth. This is about the Tulsa Race Massacre that happened in the early 1920s in Oklahoma in the U.S. And it was a massacre in which a number of Black Americans were killed. They don't actually know the final number of people that were killed. The uh, like Tulsa kind of government and Oklahoma, they just buried it and really tried to pretend that it didn't happen. They actually went and took out like newspaper articles out of the newspaper about it and hid it away. And so this starts off with a very like in-depth, kind of almost play-by-play -play of how the massacre got started. What was, you know, the match and what lit the fire kind of thing. So it gives you that very detailed breakdown. My original impression was that was going to be most of the book and then we might have a flash forward and we would talk a bit about where we are now and everything. And that was, it was sort of the opposite of that. The author is very much a part of the story. He does give the background of what happened and then you sort of jump forward a bit and it really follows from his perspective because he grew up there. And so when he first learned about it, he was kind of shocked and then he ends up kind of dedicating a lot of his life to researching this and publishing his uh, 
thesis about it and also just kind of helping with the modern day search that they're doing to try and find bodies of those, like the mass graves of those who were buried after the massacre, talking to people who were alive then, witness statements, kind of uh, hearsay statements even, and seeing what turns out to be true. I did listen to this one on audiobook and it might have benefited a little bit from actually reading it in physical form. I think the time jumps kind of threw me off a bit because I didn't realize that so much of the book was actually going to take place more towards present day. And so as I was going through the book, I was a little confused sometimes about where exactly we were. And it also just wasn't quite what I was expecting. I think I just didn't realize how much of this was going to be focused on the present day and focus on what the author kind of was doing and kind of following his story because he has been so involved with it. Uh, so I, I had to adjust my expectations throughout the book and I just think that the blurb doesn't really, I didn't get that impression from the blurb. I thought it was going to be a lot more about what happened in 1921. So when we got through the first chapter or so, which was chunky, it was a chunky chapter, and then we jumped forward, I was kind of surprised. I just didn't understand that that's how it was going to be told. So it's still a good book. Like if you're wanting to learn more about that and kind of learn where we are now, it's great. I just wish my expectations had been a little bit different. And if that was the case, I feel like I would have enjoyed it more. Numbers three and four, I had a big debate in my head about which one was going to go where, because obviously three is what could be one of the ones that moves on. Four could be one of the ones that doesn't just because of my vote. I did in the end decide to put under a White Sky, The Nature of the Future by Elizabeth Colbert in the number four spot. That being said, I really liked Elizabeth Colbert's writing style in this. This is science nonfiction, and that could be a little hit or miss depending, but I found the way she wrote this book very engaging. It probably helped the book wasn't that long either. And so this one is talking about how humans have changed the planet in certain ways by things that we have done in the past. And now we are now, we are facing the consequences of those changes. And we are now trying to come up with new scientific ways to fix the problems that we already created, if that makes sense. So this does definitely have a climate change angle, though it is not all focused on the more traditional climate change topics that I feel like we hear about. She talks about uh, uh, this very rare fish that exists in this one pool in the desert and how scientists are trying to make sure that this fish species stays alive. She talks about the rising water levels in Louisiana and how people around there are dealing with that, talking about scientists creating super coral that will survive the bleachings that happen every so often off the Great Barrier Reef. So it gave me some cool angles on things that I hadn't really heard about before. There are definitely things with climate change that you hear over and over again. And there was one particular chapter in this that definitely felt more like what I was used to hearing about, but I feel like she gave us some really interesting points of view on, here's an example of what humans did back at you know the 1800s or whatever. And now, because it's been so many years, we're feeling the effects in this way. And this is now how scientists are trying to solve it now that we know more. I appreciated how concise the book was, how well written it was. It, it was engaging for somebody who does not have a scientific background. And I, I thought it was also important, like it was good to know about. It's not super depressing, like a book about climate change can be very depressing. This is not quite that bad. There are those moments of sort of hope with the, what the scientists are doing. Uh, but it can be a bit heavy at times. A lot of these feelings that I was having with this book about feeling like how it was written and how it, how important it felt for people to know about it, I also felt about the book that I put in the number three spot, and that was Facing the Mountain, A True Story of Japanese American Heroes in World War II by Daniel James Brown. I had definitely seen this book around before it got given to me, and I am somebody that enjoys a good World War II story. This is focused on Japanese Americans and what happened to them during World War II. Not only the families that were shuttled into concentration camps, but also the men who actually decided to fight on behalf of the U.S., even though their families had been taken away from everything they you know, ever owned and been forced to live in these really uh, unfavorable, kind of harsh conditions. Uh, so you do spend a lot of time mostly with the 442nd 
regimental combat team. They were deployed to France, Germany, and Italy, and it was made up entirely of Japanese Americans. And you learn about the formation of that combat team, and you focus on a few different soldiers within there. And you also hear about a few other people that are not soldiers, but are still Japanese Americans that are doing things back on home soil and, and what's happening with them. And I felt that this book deserved to be in the third spot because I wanted people to know about this book and feel the need to read it. I was already aware of what happened to Japanese Americans with them being uh, being forced from their homes. There was an exclusion zone along the edge of the west coast. You were herded off to a concentration camp where you had to live for multiple years and you, it, some of them were able to create really nice communities there, but the conditions were still very harsh, very cold, hot, windy, dry, and not at all, obviously, how people want to live. Just seeing how they treated not only the people who were like first generation family members who couldn't become American citizens at the time, but also their children who were born in America, were considered American citizens, and how they were treated is very frustrating to get a lot of the detail on that, even though I already knew it wasn't a great situation. And then just the stuff that they went through it, just fighting in Europe against the Nazis that, uh, it was also very interesting and frustrating and sad seeing what happened to them and, and talking about some of the key highlights of what they did, what they're known for. And then of course, my usually my favorite part of a book is like where we are now and sort of, you know, you get all of this information about them back in the 1940s. And then in the final chapter, they say, okay, this gentleman that we talked about, and you followed along for 450 pages. In our last 50 pages, we're gonna talk about where everybody is now and what happened to them and what they decided to do with their lives after they came back from the war. So I always appreciate the big like sweeping scope of something like that. I just really want people to pick up this book and learn a bit more about what they sacrificed for everyone else. My top two books are both books I had already read before going into this round. Number two, I put Empire of Pain, The Secret History of the Sackler Dynasty by Patrick Radden Keefe. I read this for the Octafinals. This is a book that I was already interested in reading before I picked it up. And so in that original round, it was my number one. So of course, I was happy to see that it had made it to the semifinals, but I didn't need to read it again because I already read it all back in February and March that that round was. Yeah, so I read it back then. This is about the Sackler family. They created OxyContin, which is a huge player in the current opioid epidemic. I'm sure many of you are aware of this book already. It's gotten a lot of uh, hype on booktube. And this book is also a very sweeping history where we follow the original Sackler brothers, Arthur Sackler kind of being the head of the three of them, the creation of their companies and how they sort of rose to have a lot of money and the medical marketing strategy that Arthur developed that is still in use today and, and what kind of made them rich. And then we have sort of halfway through the book, we have the changing of the guard as the original three brothers start to, to pass away. We have the second generation of the family taking over and that's when OxyContin was developed and they really just seemed so out of touch with society. They did not care at all about what was happening to the people around them. They just wanted their money and their name on every museum or university building that they possibly could. They would just throw money everywhere. So if you have thought about reading this book, I absolutely recommend that you do. You will get so much information in here. It will make you very angry, but it is definitely about the Sackler family, not about the opioid ep epidemic so much and the people it affected. That's not really what you're gonna get in this book. This does have so much information in it though that the author, uh, he was clearly trying to give us as much information as possible, but there were certain times where I felt like it kind of dragged us down a bit. So that's why I gave this one four stars, but that's why it ended up falling second this time around, because the final book, my number one, is American Baby, A Mother, A Child, and the Shadow History of Adoption by Gabrielle Glazer. And this one, I feel, did not get weighed down by so much information. This was a, a good length of a book. I gave it four and a half out of five, and I felt that it was, it's just 
worked perfectly for me. This one I had not been previously assigned to read. I actually picked this one up on my own back in April. This looks at adoption in post-war America, so after World War II, when in the 1950s and 60s, like premarital sex was happening, but there wasn't really birth control and abortion was illegal. So there were a lot of babies that were being given up. And so it sort of became a business. It became an industry to work in adoptions and matching these babies with these families. This does look at the wider lens of kind of what adoption used to look like up and, and then working our way up to the 1960s, seeing where we are now, and then also focusing on one particular family and their story, which I thought really helped move this book along and gave it a lot of emotional weight because she clearly spent a lot of time with these people, the author, and had gotten to know them to the point that when we got to the end, I felt emotional. I didn't quite cry but I did get, like, I did well up a little bit. The family is based around this woman who got pregnant when she was 16 and the baby was taken away from her. And she tried so hard to get him back for years and years and years. You see him growing up, uh, having been adopted by another family and then her, their kind of lives running parallel to each other and how close they were to each other, physically close they were to each other a lot of times without even knowing it and, and kind of how that ended up. Uh, in present day and it's just ooh, it's an emotional journey and I just thought it was the perfect length. I found the information that I learned very interesting which is good because I already had my eye on this book. I clearly already wanted to read it and so just because this book is, it's the second best book that I've read this year. The first book is not a book that I've read for the booktube prize, but this is definitely the best book that I've read for the booktube prize and that is why it is number one in my semifinals ranking. Once again, if you read for this group specifically, let me know what your rankings were. I believe there were 24 other judges with me, so there's many of you out there who have an opinion and uh, let, let me know how you ranked all of them. If you've read any of these books, not for the booktube prize, let me know what you thought of them as well. Do you, do you like them or not like them as much as I did? As always, all of our links are in the down bar. You can go check those out if you feel so inclined. Thank you all very much for watching and I'll see you later.